or that we will begin again because of the uh, glitch in the recording. So yes, um, last week we looked at First Thessalonians chapter four, uh, where we uh, saw the description of the rapture being given, and then when we come to First Thessalonians chapter five, uh, it begins with these words: First Thessalonians chapter five, uh, verses one and two. It says, uh, "Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you." For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. It mentions the day of the Lord over here. Now, this day of the Lord, which is being mentioned over here, would be the second coming. So in chapter 4, what we looked at was the rapture event, where Jesus has not really come down to the earth. He only comes in the clouds. And it's the believers who are caught up into the air. So that was uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But here in chapter 5, it talks about the day of the Lord. Now, this would be a reference to the second coming. And uh, the things which are said over here indicates that this is a separate event, uh, a different event from the one which is mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4. So we will be looking at some of the details uh, regarding this. Uh, so, if we could have any one person read out for us uh, the first seven verses, maybe. So, First Thessalonians chapter five, verses one to seven, please. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Thank you. So we see here uh, that when this day of the Lord comes, there will be destruction which suddenly comes upon the people of the world. Uh, now, this is not something which is mentioned in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, there, it's just the Lord coming in the clouds to collect his people. And um, those who have passed away, who have died physically, uh, their bodies will be resurrected. So we, we just saw those details. Here, in this day of the Lord, there's judgment being brought upon the people. So there are actually two separate events being mentioned over here. Um, now, if we were to, you know, just uh, refer to a couple of things in the previous chapter, First uh, Thessalonians four verses sixteen to seventeen, over there it talks about how the Lord will come uh, at the time of the rapture event. It says over there uh, that the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with a trumpet call of God. So this loud command which the Lord gives uh, with the voice of an archangel and uh, a trumpet call is given. And when this um, command and trumpet call are given, the dead in Christ will rise first. So it's like a, it's like a cry of triumph, a cry of victory where God is saying, all of you who have died up to now, rise up from the dead. And, you know, the people will actually rise up from the dead and um, death will be defeated. It will stand defeated. I mean, because imagine, right from the beginning of time, from the time that Adam and Eve fell, death has been there in the world and um, nobody can escape it. A person may be the most powerful and influential and rich richest person on earth, 
but then even he dies everyone is subject to death and now when jesus comes on that day you know he gives a loud command with the voice of an archangel and he the trumpet call is sounded and literally dead people dead uh, you know dead bodies will be resurrected they will be um, brought back to life and the people who have um, you know died will be rejoined with their physical bodies so this is similar to what jesus did with lazarus he stands in from the tomb and he says come out you know uh, he, he says to uh, lazarus and lazarus comes out so this is like that kind of a loud command um, and um, in first corinthians 15 verses 50 to 52 this thought is you know repeated um, again and again over here as well in first corinthians 15 verses 50 to 52 it talks about how the trumpet will be sounded um if we could in fact have someone read out for us uh, those verses first corinthians 15 50 to 52 Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed yes so here we see um, the same thing you know uh, paul is uh, referring to the same event over here he says we will not all sleep so not all the believers uh, will die some will still be alive and the ones who are alive they will be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye they will receive their resurrected bodies they will be changed um, and uh, it says, when the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. So the uh, dead persons whose bodies had perished in the ground, those bodies will be resurrected. So in both these uh, places, in 1 Thessalonians 4 and in 1 Corinthians 15, it's talking about a rapture event when the, all the believers will be uh, uh, resurrected. They will receive their resurrected bodies. On the other hand, when we look at First Thessalonians chapter 5, where it talks about the day of the Lord, there's a different description given regarding that. It says in verse 3, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. So here it talks about Jesus literally coming down to the earth to bring judgment. So that will be the second coming event. Um, and uh, uh, the judgment is described with the labor pains of a pregnant woman. I mean, uh, uh, when the you know expectant mother is waiting for the birth of the child, um, there are some indications that you know the, 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 the child is going to come soon. I mean, uh, the mother begins to experience contractions, you know, so there are some um, signs beforehand which which make the mother aware that, OK, in the near future, the baby is going to be coming. So in the same way, in the last days, there are going to be many signs indicating that there's a judgment coming. So those who choose to respond to this, you know, who take the warning which God is giving and they repent, they will be saved. But there are some who will ignore those signs and they will act as though, you know, what uh, the warning which is giving, given, which is being given will never happen. They, they just choose to ignore it. But just because someone ignores the warning that is being given, it doesn't mean that the event will not take place. In the, in, you know, just like in the case of a mother, the mother can choose to ignore her contractions, though, of course, that would be difficult to do. But, you know, uh, if even if a mother chooses to ignore the contractions, when the time comes, the birth will happen. The baby will come. So in the same way, in the end times, 
there are men you know in the in the book of revelation we see that the angels go through the earth giving a warning um you know that judgment is coming so people are given a chance to repent even in that last time in the, in this in this end timings people are given a chance to repent but if they choose to ignore those signs then destruction will come judgment will come and it says they will not escape but you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief so uh, here paul says these people the people of the world they may choose to ignore what is being you know said by god they may choose to ignore the signs they may choose to ignore the warnings but we who belong to the lord we shouldn't be taken by surprise the way those people of the world are going to be taken by surprise and because we are people who should be ready all the time we should always be um equipping ourselves spiritually doing the things of god so that we will be well prepared for uh, that judgment day so judgment will catch the unbelievers by surprise but it should not catch us by surprise uh, so first thessalonians 5 is actually talking about the revelation 19 event where you have the uh, second coming being described in 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 very uh, in a very grand manner so this revelation 19 uh, event is very different from the rapture event here you literally have god coming with his entire army jesus coming with his army um yeah maybe we could have someone read out some of those verses uh, revelation 19 verses 14 to 16 i think that should be yeah that that should be all right revelation 19 14 to 16 if someone could read out and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen white and clean followed him on white horses now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty god yeah so here it talks about how um jesus you know when he comes back in the second coming he comes uh, to judge the peoples it says that he treads the wine press of the fury of the wrath of god almighty so he is now coming to release god's anger and wrath and judgment upon those who have not accepted him in fact um um this is what the angel says in revelation 19:17 uh, he you know the angel cries out and says to the birds in the air come gather together for the great supper of god so that you may eat the flesh of kings generals and the mighty so uh, the second coming is an event of judgment the rapture on the other hand was a peaceful event in the sense only uh, the people of god were collected and uh, they received their resurrected bodies so uh, there are two separate events and um, then in verse 5 you know um, paul goes on to say uh, the people of the world when the second coming happens you know they may be fast asleep they may not prepare themselves for uh, the coming of god uh, so he says uh, so then let us not be like others who are asleep but let us be awake and sober for those who sleep sleep at night and those who get drunk get drunk at night uh, so here there's a, a distinction may being made between daytime and nighttime in a metaphorical sense it's not talking about your literal day and the literal night it's using these two terms in a metaphorical sense um, and uh, so the day is considered Uh, as you know uh, the as, uh, as belonging as belonging to that um, phase where you have the people of god living in the light in the light of god so it's you know compared to day on the other hand the people of darkness who are not living in the light of god um the phase in which they are living that's uh, considered as night 
over here. So, you know, in Ephesians 5, 13 to 14, uh, you have a verse over there in Ephesians 5, 13 to 14, where it says uh, that people who are living in the darkness, um, they will, uh, you know, they, they are, you know, uh, following the deeds of darkness. And it says in Ephesians 5, 14, this is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So the, the image of sleeping is used to talk about spiritual death. It's also used to talk about spiritual indifference. Uh, so here, when it talks about people who are sleeping you know, in the night, it's basically talking about that. It's talking about people who are spiritually dead, uh, who are not responding to the, to the things of God. And Paul says, let us not be like those people. We should be spiritually alert, aware of even the smallest things that God is saying to us. So we should not be asleep like them and spiritually dead like them, is what he says. A second comparison that he uses is of drunkenness. People who are drunk are under the influence and control of something else, which is outside of them. You know, they are under the control of the liquor, the alcohol. That controls them, that makes them act in a certain way, that makes them take certain decisions. So people who, on the other hand, who are sober, who are not drunk, they will have self-control. They will have control over themselves and they can decide what to do and what not to do. So that is the distinction which Paul brings out over here. Uh, the people of the world, they are drunk with the things of the world. So it's the things of the world, the lusts of the world, which control them and make them take their decisions. On the other hand, we who are sober and awake, we make our decisions wisely. We are not you know, swayed by other forces from outside. So um, this actually reminds us of John 9, 4 to, 4 to 5, you know, where, it, where Jesus talks about day and night. Um, and uh, Jesus says over there in John 9, 4 to 5, as long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. So uh, daytime is, is uh, metaphorically used to talk about that time when you know the grace of God is still available to anyone who wishes to repent. The work of God is going on. The people of God are working to bring um, unbelievers into the kingdom. So all this is happening during the day uh, when, uh, when the grace of God is still being available, openly being offered to people. Night will be the time when judgment comes off. So once it becomes night and once judgment comes, there's no second chance left for the people of um, the world who have not repented. So once night comes, even the church of God can no longer continue to you know, do its work of saving people, sharing the gospel. All that will be closed. So which is why Jesus urges in John 9 and he says, as long as it is day, you know, continue to do the works uh, of God. Because once it becomes night, it will be too late and nobody uh, can be saved. So, so here... Um, Paul is using that imagery of day and night and he says, let us act like people who belong to the day and not to the uh, night. So how are we supposed to be sober and awake? How exactly do we do that? That is explained in verse uh, 8. Uh, if we could have someone read out for us uh, verses 8 to 11. Yeah. Chapter 5. Verses 8 to 11, please. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ 
who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Yeah. So um, how do we stay sober and awake? We stay sober and awake by putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. So again, Paul brings up this theme of faith, hope, and love. Um, if you notice, the breastplate is made up of two things over here. You know, he uses the imagery of the breastplate to talk about faith and love. It's not enough for us to just have a faith in Jesus, uh, to believe that he can do wonderful things in our lives, to trust that he will provide for us. It is good to believe. It is good to have faith. But there must also be love. They, both of these things together work as a breastplate. So you cannot just say, I want to have one and not the other. So if a person is full of faith, but they have no love, then uh, the breastplate would be incomplete, which is why in Galatians 5, 6, when we were covering that, uh, it talks about what kind of a faith we should have. Um, over there in Galatians 5, 6, it says, the only thing that counts, you know, over there, uh, Paul is talking about how it's not important whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. The only thing that counts is faith. What kind of faith? Uh, faith expressing itself through love. So it's not enough to have faith. It should be the, that kind of a faith in Christ, which actually expresses itself in loving God and loving people. So that kind of a faith is what counts. Uh, so here it is, uh, you know, Paul says that it's both faith and love which together make up the breastplate. So you need to be acting in faith and a faith which is expressed in love, that kind of a faith, that will become your breastplate. And then you also should be wearing the hope of salvation as a helmet because the, Satan will attack us with thoughts, you know, uh, saying, what are you achieving? I mean, all the ministry that you're doing, is it of any effect? You know, so negative thoughts like that. Or uh, Satan may bring thoughts saying, you know, um, you have undergone so much persecution. You've been so sincere. But re what reward have you received? You know, you see other Christians who are not even interested in, you know, growing in the Lord and uh, their lives are going well. You, on the other hand, are enduring so many tribulations and sufferings. So negative thoughts like that, you know, may attack our minds. Or we may have uh, doubts regarding the scripture itself. You know, Satan may cause us to doubt the word. Uh, he, we, may, we may start thinking, um, is this what this verse really means? Maybe, you know, maybe this is not the correct interpretation. And so we kind of lose faith in those promises which God is giving to us. So there are different ways in which Satan would try to attack our thinking, our thoughts. And so the hope of salvation serves as a helmet. This word of God and what is written over there in, in, in those scriptures, if we can continuously cover our minds with those scriptures, then those scriptures act as a hope and as a helmet and they will guard us from the uh, attacks of the uh, evil one so we need the breastplate of faith expressing itself through love and we need the helmet of salvation which is basically all the scriptures which tell us who we are and what our status is and what god has done for us um, so we need to put on these two things and live in a sober way because God has not really appointed us for wrath but rather he wanted us to have salvation he wanted us to have the privilege of living with him always whether we are awake or asleep in the sense of whether we are alive or whether we are, de we are dead it doesn't matter the, the destination the future which he has for us is the privilege of living with him always and this is such a grand privilege not even death can take us away from God. You know, death, in fact, will bring us closer to God because we will literally be in his presence. So this is the privilege which we are looking forward to. Therefore, Paul says in verse 11, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. 
so he says do not get discouraged you know uh, continue to encourage each other to stay faithful to the lord he says um there was this phrase which i came across in your notes uh, which you know uh, sounded good it says believers do not need to be hearing something new all the time but they often do need to remind themselves of what they already know so that they do not forget it you know because um, we always want to hear new things uh, exciting things things which will catch our fancy you know and uh, when we go to the church and the pastor does not preach anything new but he has just you know told us what we already know we come back home and we say ah the sermon was so boring i know all that already so this is actually such a valid statement um it says in your notes believers do not need to be hearing something new all the time but they often do need to remind themselves of what they already know so we don't always have to be running after fancy teachings the basic solid word of god which is already you know being taught to us if we can just remind each other of that and encourage each other to hold on to that that will prepare us for the second coming and and in fact for the rapture so um the word of god is not meant to entertain the word of god is given so that we can constantly go on reminding ourselves of it and living according to it so that we are built up so that we become mature so that when the rapture happens and then later when the judgment of god takes place you know we can stand there confidently knowing that uh, we have uh, taken the effort to grow in god um so he that's why he says you know encourage one another build each other up do not get discouraged do not uh, be like those people of the world who are sleeping and who are unaware of spiritual things then okay verse 12 onwards um if we could have someone read out maybe from verse 12 all the way up to verse 15 yes verses 12 to 15 please and we urge you brethren to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake be at peace among yourselves now we exhort you brethren warn those who are unruly comfort the faint hearted uphold the weak be patient with all see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all yeah so he has told us that we should be sober not drunk we should be sober and awake now he's explaining you know these are some of the things which you can do to prepare yourself to stay sober to stay awake so the first thing that he says is you know there have been leaders appointed over you by god uh he says acknowledge the hard work that they are putting in you know because they are trying to care for you in the lord they're trying to care for you in the way that the lord would care for you if he were physically here so because they are putting in that effort you know acknowledge their efforts um uh, and he he says they also admonish you you know they correct you so when they are doing that hold them in the highest regard in love you know don't hate them don't be angry with them don't uh, backbite and speak against them rather accept the correction which they are offering and he says live in peace with each other uh, because this is one of the main points uh, you know um, that we come across in almost every church setting where satan tries to um, tries to bring um, some kind of unrest and disunity between the leadership and the congregation you know so this is one tactic which satan uses to to make the church ineffective so that we are not ready and prepared for the lord's coming uh it is the responsibility of the leaders uh, to care for the for the flock in the same way that the lord would 
care for the flock, which would obviously mean even discipline. You know, so in the same way, the Lord uh, not only shows love and patience, he also corrects and disciplines. In the same way, even the leadership will have to take those steps. They will have to admonish. So uh, Satan will try to instigate the congregation and make them develop you know, a grudge or some kind of uh, anger towards the leaders. So he's, he's warning them and he's telling them, don't allow the evil one to take advantage in this manner. Continue to hold the leadership in high regard, in love. You know, continue to love them. And uh, he says, live in peace with each other. And then he goes on to give other um, instructions, uh, which are important for being sober and awake. You know, so the first thing he says, uh, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Now, this is generally what happens. Anyone who is idle will also most likely start be becoming disruptive because you know that um, you have that popular saying i mean it's not in the bible but there's a popular saying that says an idle mind is the devil's workshop so if you're, if you're idle if you're if you're not occupied in doing the things of god the devil will start using your idle mind for his doings so being idle is a dangerous thing so um, paul says warn those who are idle and disruptive in fact he he speaks sharply about this in the second letter you know because uh, like i had said earlier some of the people uh, were thinking that jesus is going to come back very very soon and so they had you know stopped working and because they're idle and they have too much time on their hands now they were meddling in other people's affairs and they were you know uh, bringing about disunity and there was disruption going on so one very useful piece of advice for anyone who wants to stay sober and awake, stay busy doing the things of God. Of course, we can be busy with the things of the world. I mean, you know, um, you know, gathering money and adding to our status. And, uh, you know, uh, there are worldly pursuits with which we can stay very, very busy. But stay busy doing the things of God. If you're doing that, that is a very good way to prepare yourself for the second coming. Um, the second thing that you can actually do is encourage the disheartened. You know, we come across believers when we're having just our general chats and conversations. We sometimes notice that some people are feeling very discouraged. You know, they they feel like they have been sincere, followed the Lord, and everything has gone wrong and they're wondering whether God will ever do anything good for them in the future and they're losing hope. So one very wonderful thing that we can do while we are waiting for the second coming of the Lord, one very good thing that we can do is encourage the disheartened, those who are you know feeling very discouraged because life has been very tough for them and they're wondering whether there's any future hope. So we must encourage the disheartened. The third thing he says, help the weak this probably refers to you know new believers uh, they are weak in the sense they have not yet grown enough in god uh, so they don't trust god as much because i mean simply because they don't know him that intimately yet the more you start getting to the lord know the lord intimately the easier it is to trust him because you really know his heart you really know how he is and so it's 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 easy for you to, to trust on the other hand, someone who has not yet grown in God much, who, who is still spiritually weak, they are uh, they still haven't learned to trust God enough because they still don't know him that well. And so such people would need a support network till they can really grow. Uh, other believers should help them, you know, support them, encourage them, and um, maybe even admonish them to hold on to God and not you know, go back into temptation, not to go back into sin. So someone has to help the new believers until they can become stronger and become more mature. I mean, where would I be today if it had not been for so many people who invested in my life? You know, back then when I was weak, spiritually weak, oh, I was thinking I was a, I was a wonderful person because, you know, um, uh, because I was growing and I was feeling very confident and all of that. But in reality, I was still quite weak. 
and then it was the people around me who corrected me who encouraged me they helped me to start getting stronger and stronger so we need to help those who are still spiritually weak uh, because once a person becomes a believer they become very confident they think oh now i'm part of the family of god and now you know uh, the lord's favor is upon me so they tend to get overconfident and they don't realize that they need to actually grow so it is we who have you know battled uh, all the you know um, uh, schemes and strategies of the evil one we know from experience how it is how easy it is to fall so we are in a position to you know warn these new believers and help them to hold on so that they don't have to go through what we went through you know so uh, we have to help the weak and it also says be patient with everyone make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong this is such an important you know commandment because when we are moving about in a church setting you know um, associating with one another interacting with one another we will get hurt by somebody or the other i mean you know this is um, this is bound to happen uh, because in all relationships um, there are negative things which take place so in such circumstances the command that is given is be patient with everyone make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong so even if our feelings get hurt even if someone does something which you know um, um harms us in some way the command we are given is do not pay back wrong for wrong rather be patient so um this is very very important because uh, satan can use this to uh, make believers ineffective to make the church ineffective if you remember when we you know when when uh, earlier in, in the earlier verse when paul says let us be sober putting on faith and love as a breastplate you see that breastplate needs to have faith but that breastplate also needs to have love otherwise that breastplate will be full of holes what what would happen to a soldier if he went on you know into the battlefield uh, with a breastplate that is that is full of holes the arrows of the enemy can pierce him you know the arrows can get into his uh, lungs and you know pierce his heart and the soldier would be dead so it is so important that your breastplate not only be made up of faith but it also should be made up of love what kind of a love a love that is so patient that it endures even though the other person is being rude or hurt and they they choose not uh in the church there are so many human interactions so of you know people upsetting one another this becomes a very important uh, thing to remember um just to you know um dwell a little more on this point uh, in psalm 103 um, verses 8 to 10 it describes how the lord treats us and i think we should have the same attitude uh, i think uh, this verse you know this passage in psalm 103 fits very well with what is being commanded over here in the thessalonian passage so if we could actually have someone go to psalm 103 and read out verses 8 to 10 please psalm 103 verses 8 to 10 The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. This is how the Lord treats us, you know, with compassion and grace. 
Now we are expected to show that same kind of compassion and grace towards those who may be hurting us or who have, you know someone who has, who may who might have wronged us. So here in the Psalm 103 passage, it talks about you know the Lord being long suffering, or in you know some versions it will say slow to anger. Um, that Hebrew word that I think we have touched upon this earlier. The Hebrew word that is used over there, literally, if you were to translate that Hebrew word, it would be basically uh, the Lord is long of nose. You know, the nose. It's like as if he has a long nose. That's literally the wording that is used in Hebrew. If you were to literally translate it, uh, long of nose is translated in English as long suffering or slow to anger. Because the nose was associated with anger. You know, when a person gets angry, it's like as if they are, you know, uh, it's like as if there's smoke coming out of their nostrils. Uh, so that was the image which the Hebrew people had in their mind. So someone who, has a, who is long of nose basically is a person whose nose does not get heated up easily. Their anger is not kindled easily. So basically, they considered Yahweh as a God who is long of nose. He's long suffering. His anger does not get kindled very quickly. So you know, you will not have the 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 fumes, the smoke being formed in in his nostrils very very quickly. So that, that's the word picture that is used. We should be in the same uh, way. So. We should be patient with everyone, is what Paul says. Do not, so we should be long of nose. Our anger should not be kindled very, very fast. We should be patient and we should see that we do not pay back wrong for wrong. Um, so the latter portion of that verse it says, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. So when someone hurts us, what should be our response? We should strive to do what is good. Uh, and this thought is brought out very, very nicely in Re Romans chapter 12, 17 to 21. Uh, so if we could have someone read out that, you know, almost exactly what is being said over here, that is repeated in greater detail in Romans chapter 12. Uh, so if someone could read out Romans 12, 17 to 21. Romans 12, 17 to 21. Romans chapter 12, verse 17 to 21. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Yes. So, um, I mean, I remember one uh, time in my life when I was really upset, very, very angry with someone. Uh, and that person had genuinely hurt me. You know, so I was very, very upset about that. And uh, so uh, the Lord spoke to me from this passage. He said, do not repay anyone evil for evil. No, anyone, even the person who feel, you feel has wronged you a lot, you have no right to repay them evil for evil. And this verse 21 really caught my eye. Uh, it, it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Because I was on the verge of being overcome by evil. I wanted to lash out. I wanted to hurt that person. And the Lord said, do not be overcome by evil, but rather overcome evil with good. Do good for that person. Speak good about that person. You know, so that really convicted me at that point of time. And uh, so he, uh, over here, when Paul is writing to the Romans, he, he uses... Um, uh, a verse from Proverbs where he talks about if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And uh, it says over there, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Uh, I'm pretty sure we covered this particular you know, verse in one of our classes. Uh, so in those days, uh, especially in that Mediterranean you know, region, uh, 
the nights are extremely cold uh, so they would basically have this burning coals uh, you know they would keep it near their bedside so that they can get some warmth from it uh, i mean especially if they're sleeping out in the open like you know like have shepherds who sleep in the open you have people uh, who live in huts who do not have proper houses they would basically have these coals burning coals near them so that the heat which is generated from that you know will be like a like a warmth and a comfort to them to them so even though your enemy has hurt you you in fact lovingly liberally generously give him an entire you know a, a tray of burning coals to take along with him so even as he's carrying that on his head you know it it gives him warmth it um, it comforts him but this is well, there's another side to it if that person to whom you have showed kindness and love is not grateful for what you have done then god will you know bring judgment against that person so this burning coals rather than giving them warmth would in fact turn like a judgment against them so there's a kind of uh, uh, double imagery when that particular verse is used in proverbs that is the actual old testament uh, meaning for that particular verse and that's the way the people of uh, israel would have understood it in those days so here you know uh, in, in the romans passage paul is saying this is the way you should respond to someone who has hurt you you know feed them if they are thirsty give them drink and in this way you know heap burning coals on their head liberally generously give them all the coal that they need let it bring them warmth let it bring them comfort and if they still work against you in spite of the kindness which you are showing god will take care of it god will judge you know like it says in verse 19 do not take revenge my dear friends but leave room for god's wrath god knows very well how to deal with the situation so you make room for him to deal with it in his own way you don't take the action into your own hands from your side all your all your expect to do is generously give those burning coals so that you know that person can be can be warmed and comforted and uh, do good to them so here in our thessalonian passage coming back you know now that we have understood what is being said um, he he uh, paul commands and says be patient with everyone make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else so this should be our attitude towards each other you know when we are hurt or we are angry about something um and then he comes to these uh, to this uh, next portion where he says uh, rejoice always pray continually give thanks in all circumstances for this is god's will for you in christ jesus these verses are being written to the thessalonian believers who have undergone a lot of persecution who are suffering even when you know, when he sends this letter even during that time they are still suffering we saw that in um, first thessalonians chapter 2 where paul says in the same way the believers in jerusalem you know were persecuted for their faith you guys have been persecuted to that level and you have been faithful so um, we'll dwell more upon these verses when we come back from our break thank you